Good morning. I hope you are awake. Um, so today there will be a few talks uh, about stuff people work on in their thesis or their postdoc work. And so there's one rule today. Everybody of you should ask at least one question at some point. And it can be on any, any sort of level, any sort of difficulty. If you don't dare to ask it in public, you can ask it uh, via chat or via an email to me. Uh, and I will just read it out and not tell anybody where the question comes from. Uh, but everybody should ask one question. Okay, uh, so the first speaker is Daniel Zubenhauer, who is not yet in Bonn. Not yet, <laughs> yes. In Bonn already since some time, <laughs> and was in Bonn before. Uh, and he will talk about double centralizing theorem category 5 is what? <laughs> well, thank you very much for having me. I already asked one question here. My title is a question. Very good. So I'm done. Um, Yes, um, so I, I hope I will tell you something today that you all have seen before and you all will like. Um, basically what I'm going to address is the following very old uh, well, idea, a classical idea in algebra. It's called the double centralizer theorem. So I'm not stating the most general one, but basically you have some nice algebra and you have some nice module of it. And um, then you can consider the centralizer, which is my algebra B down here. Uh, so this is just all endomorphisms of my module which commute with the action of A. And that again acts on, on, on the module and the double centralizer theorem says that A is actually equivalent to, to the, well, this one here, right? So A is equivalent to the end of the end A of M. Um, so that's an isomorphism. In, in any reasonable setup you can think of, this is an isomorphism. I, I'll show you some counterexamples later, um, but in any reasonable setup, this should be an isomorphism. But I claim you have all seen this before. So let's, let's just keep this in mind. I think this is pretty easy to remember. You just have A and you have double centralizers. You have an end and an end of a nice module. And I claim you have all seen this before, in particular, maybe in the in the last few lectures you have seen. So, so let's just go through it very slowly. Okay, so the main point is, well, there's some bad news. So basically you will see that it kind of stabilizes. So you, you first naive approach would maybe be, well, I have an, N, I have an algebra, I have a module, I can take endomorphisms of that module, I get a new algebra. And then I can take endomorphisms of that module and I get new algebra. But this process kind of stabilizes and you can't create many new algebras. That's in some sense bad news, in particular on the categorical level. So when you have a nice, we will see it later, when you have a nice category acting on something, you don't get many new categories from the same strategy. So that's in some sense bad, um, but there's some, some good news. There's basically a, a really crucial relationship between A and B. And in, 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 in many examples, which we'll go through very slowly, um, you both, all of you know A and B, and so in some sense A is sometimes easier than B, or B is easier than A, so you can play them against each other. So let's just, let's just give you some, so and I claim this goes back to those guys, and let me explain why. So I click on this link, and one instance you've all seen in your life before, so if you add some extra condition on, on, on B or A, then this is basically Morita equivalence. So A mod is equivalent to B mod if and only if M is a very nice module. It's usually called a progenerator. It doesn't really matter what it is. It's, it's nicer than in the theorem before. But you have kind of, kind of double centralizer property here. Um, and this was basically, that, that's why I, I want to like to contribute this double centralizer theorem partially to Morita. So this is classical Morita theory. So one instance why I claim you can play A and B against each other is in a lot of cases they're actually Morita equivalent. Not always, but in a lot of cases they are Morita equivalent. Okay, so Morita equivalence is a, a certain part of being having a double centralizer property. Another example all of you know is your vile duality. So this is your vile duality in, in this setup. It just it just looks as follows. Um, if you take any subalgebra of, of so, so any any matrix subalgebra of, of the module, so uh, the only requirement here is I have a, I have my ground field to be well, it's just some ground field, 
and I already know the, the centralizer and AA semi simple. So this, this is the easy case. Then you automatically have the double centralizer property. And this should look familiar from Cheval duality. Well, I will go to explicit examples in a second, but you basically can decompose M into a, a, a left module of A and a right module of B. And depending on what side you like, one of them will be the multiplicity space and one of them will be, will be the module. And this is, of course, classical Cheval duality. So classical Cheval duality is, it's, is in some sense, again, just a consequence of some double centralizer property. And the third case, right? Don't worry right now. I will give you very explicit examples in a second. But the third case you should keep in mind is this one. Um, so if M is a nice module, like a projective module, I have an idempotent and I just take a projective module and it's, 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 it's nice, so faithful, just means that, that only zero acts as zero. So almost all modules will be faithful in some sense. And you take B then uh, to be the centralizer, then you can actually check that B is this idempotent truncation and you get a, a, a bijection between symbols of A and B. Although usually the idempotent truncation is much easier, much smaller um, than the algebra A itself. Uh, you have to pay a price, you don't get all symbols, but you, you get a, a certain number of symbols namely the one that survives when you, when you uh, plug them in, uh, when, you, when you flank them with the item portent. Okay, and I claim, we'll give an exi explicit example in a second. So there, there are two instances of this. Uh, the Schur algebra, it's again Schurval duality, I will explain it in a second. And there's also, uh, also Zergel's endomorphism that's, uh, which is also an instance of, of, of the double centralizer property. Okay, so um, let me summarize. So double centralizer property, Daniel, it's endomorphism satz. It's the endomorphism satz. That's right. And I will call it endomorphism satz. But actually, it's a, it is the structure satz. But anyway, um, I, I will come back to that in a second. Yes. Uh, thank you very much. Um, so let me summarize. Um, so you have the Morita equivalence is uh, a part of the double centralizer theorem. You have Cheval duality as a part of the double centralizer theorem. And you have this unimportant truncation stuff uh, as part of the double centralizer theorem. Okay, so you really, really have a nice relationship between A and B. And it's pretty general. You only need to have certain assumptions on A and certain assumptions on B. Okay, so that's, that's already pretty cool. But let me run you through some examples, some very explicit examples. Um, so two non-examples, but the really the one I would like to keep you in mind is, is the, the honest example. It looks very silly, but actually it's, it's exactly what's going on. So what is the easiest algebra I can imagine? Well, the easiest algebra I can imagine is a ground field. So let's just take A to be the ground field. And the ground field acts obviously on anything, in particular on K to the N. And yeah, the ground field acts always nice. So this is certainly a faithful module. Um, and what are linear endomorphisms of K to the N? Well, all, all of you know the answer. Linear endomorphisms of K to the N are matrices. And what are matrix linear endomorphisms? And matrices, of course, still act on K to the N, right? This is, this is general. The, the B will always act on, on the module itself. And here you can see it explicitly. Uh, it's the, the natural module of, of, of matrices, of course. And um, what are the endomorphisms that now commute with all matrices? Well, this is diagonal matrices with which, which one fixed entry, which you can identify again with, with K itself. And you have this very nice perfect matching of isotopic components. As in, in well, in this case, it's pretty silly because of, of course, both of them have only one simple module. And <laughs> it's, it's, it's exactly the, the perfect matching of in this show value duality setup. Um, if you drop some assumptions like faithfulness, well, you can act for an instance with this algebra, x cubed, you can still act on k squared uh, with, with, with this action. And you, you can see immediately that x squared acts as zero. So you have, this is not faithful. You have something that acts as zero. And you will see in the process, you will lose, you will basically lose the, the second power because it acts as zero. So, so you, as a centralizer will be, the dual numbers and the, the centralizer of the centralizer are again the dual numbers. So faithfulness is an important condition. You basically lose in this process 
uh, everything that acts as zero if you don't take a faithful module, and at one point it stabilizes to something faithful, and you always get the same result. And if you're really crazy, you can... So self-injectivity basically just means you don't have to care about those examples here. Um, so projective equals injective, and if you don't... <laughs> I mean, this is kind of a Borel, right? So this is a very ugly algebra, and you, you can immediately see that, that something goes wrong in this case. Okay, um, don't worry about the two, two non-examples too much. I just want to make the point that you have to be a bit careful with what you allow. It's, it's not always true. It's just almost always true. But this example is, is what you should keep in mind. This is really the prototypical example. Okay, here's another example, you know. Um, actually, two. So uh, let's 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 be very slow here. So Schuval duality, or in the version of Green with the Schuh algebra, because I'm in the setup for finite dimensional algebras. So I just take the symmetric group, and I hope you all have seen that the symmetric group acts on um, on on k to the n tens of d times by just by permutation, and this is a nice faithful module of the symmetric group. Uh, usually you would state it in terms of, as I said, in terms of Schuval duality, but I want finite dimensional algebra, so I just say, okay, my, my other algebra, my centralizer algebra, is what is called the Schuh algebra. It's just, it's just the, the uh, SD linear endomorphisms of, of k to the n. And you can check that it's, 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 it's a double centralizer property. So B is the Schuh algebra, and the uh, endomorphisms of k to the n with respect to the Schuh algebra is again the symmetric group. And then you can play exactly the nice game as I said before. Um, the symmetric group is actually an idempotent truncation of the Schuh algebra, and the symbols of the symmetric group are in bijection with the symbols of the Schuh algebra if you take into account this idempotent, which you use for idempotent truncation. That's, that's Schuh-Wahl duality stated in terms of finite dimensional algebras as a special case of, uh, as a special case of the double centralizer theorem. Okay, very good. Um, and here is Zergel's Struktur, that's not Zergel's endomorphism, that's, um, it, it basically goes as follows. So what you want to do is you want to write down a finite dimensional algebra for the principal block of category O. Some, some kind of quiver for, for category O. This is just, uh, well, <laughs> this is just very complicated in general. And what Zergel basically says is, well, maybe we don't need to do that, but maybe we just, take a certain item potent and take a certain module and this should general you should think about this as being the kind of thing you take the big projective and you take its endomorphism ring and then the B algebra is just the item potent truncation of a, of a really complicated algebra A which is which is a really complicated quiver some underlying quiver algebra of, of, of category O so, so really complicated and Zergel says that this endomorphism that's that this algebra B is actually pretty easy in some sense. It's a co-invariant algebra which you can write down explicitly uh, for type E8. I mean, type E8 is crazy, of course, but in principle you can write it down for type E8. And you have this double centralizer property. Um, so usually the quiver for SL2, for example, uh, so A would be an honest quiver. SL2 would and category O for SL2, the principal block would have uh, two, two projectives, uh, a, a small one and a big one, and the endomorphism ring of the small one is trivial, and the endomorphism of the big one is, uh, are the dual numbers, Cx mod x squared. And what you basically do is you idempotent truncate, and you get a much simpler algebra, which is the algebra B, which in this case is just the dual numbers. So this is just a fancy notation for saying that Cx mod x squared because, of course, I can't compose my, my, my arrow B with anything else. So it, it, it's square is zero. Okay, and the point is, again, in, um, you basically can't write down the algebra A in general. I mean, for SL2, yeah, for SL3, it's already a little bit complicated. For SL4, it's uh, even a bit more complicated. Uh, uh, just, just a notation question. So yes. A slash or whatever this uh, line is, B, uh, this means just composing the two arrows, right? That's right. Um, uh, this means I take. So in particular, it does AB. not mean the set, the ideal generated by A, where B is equal to zero. <laughs> yes. So the endomorphism of one is trivial. So the composition AB is zero. Yeah. Okay, yes. Um, 
Uh, yes. So, uh, yes. For, for SL4, thanks for the question, by the way. For SL4, Katarina at one point has worked out this curva A. And it's not very easy. Let me just say it. Let me just say it. It's not very easy. The query varied algebra, on the other hand, is, is, is even for SL4, it's pretty simple. Okay. All right. So, again, let me summarize. Um, the prototypical example you should take in my, have in mind is uh, the ground field and matrices, and they are Morita equivalent, right? I told you this is a special case of Morita equivalence, and yeah, here you can write it down explicitly. Um, you have some non-examples. Any theory has some non-examples. But there's something you shouldn't be too worried about. I mean, come on, who wants to study this algebra? I mean, yeah, come on, whatever. <laughs> and Schoval duality is a special case. And something you, you should have seen from, from category O and, and Zergel bimodule stuff is also a special case in, in some sense. Okay, so if I just stay here, just seems to be a pretty general concept in, in the part of algebra we all like to do. So the question could be what is actually some kind of categorical analog of, of the double central other theorem? Can you write down something explicitly in terms of categories? So you want to replace A by something that decategorifies through an algebra, and you want to replace M by something that decategorifies to a module, and then kind of plays the same game. End will then not be endomorphisms, but endofunctors. Right? But you will see it in a second, it looks exactly the same, which is, is kind of fun. Um, anyway, so my, my, the question for the last 15 minutes is that I want to categorify this theorem itself. Right? I don't want to categorify an algebra, I don't want to categorify a module, I want to categorify the theorem itself. Okay, so let's try. Let's try. Um, I claim that there are two different answers and I probably don't have time to explain both of them. Um, I will show you some examples, that's for sure. But basically, I only want to have something that categorifies my algebra, right? And I have some kind of choice what kind of categorification I want to consider. And two natural candidates come to my mind. Either I can consider something abelian or I can consider something additive. Additive is a much weaker notion. And the additive version is much harder. And the abelian version is much easier. Um, but they, of course, agree in, in the case when it's semi-simple. Uh, because here's a fun fact, by the way, um, semi-simple implies abelian. That's not quite obvious, but if you have a, semi a reasonable semi-simple category, you are already abelian. So in, in this case, they, they agree. But in general, right, categorification is not unique. Why should it? You can at least say, okay, I could, could try an abelian version or I could try an additive version. Why should I try an abelian version? Well, because the abelian version is easier. Why should I try an additive version? Because there are some examples, I'll show you some examples in a second, um, where you really would like to have an additive version. Because a lot of categories you care about, maybe you've seen Zogel bimodules before. There's, for example, they're an additive category, they're not a billion. So they would fit on this side, but not on this side. Okay. So it's, it's a lot of space to play around with. Um, since I only have something like 12 minutes left, I kind of stay with the billion case because it's easier. I will state both. Um, but I will only explain the abelian case but because it's really easy. I will see it in a sec. In particular, by the way, this proof is so much harder. So here it's, you could prove it well on half a page. And this one is, 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 is an honest, uh, it, it's crazy, it's complicated. Anyway, okay, so here's a statement. Let me just scroll back. So here, it, it looks exactly the same. Let me explain. It looks exactly the same, right? Canonical, there's a canonical map from A to blah, 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 blah. And now I just say there's a canonical factor from A to blah, 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 blah. And the only thing I've changed is I changed the font to make sure that we're talking about categories right now. So the abelian double central ladder theorem is, is pretty much well known. It goes back to Etting of an Ostrich. And it basically says, I will explain the words in a second, you have a reasonable nice category, you have a reasonable nice module category, and it's exactly the same. The, the, the canonical factor is, is an equivalence of categories. Um, the additive version is much more complicated. I, I, I don't even want to explain it. it it's, it's, you have to restrict and you have to co-restrict. You only get an equivalence between certain subcategories. It's, it's, it's much more complicated. 
just forget it. Uh, but there is a version, an additive version, which includes something like Zergle bimodules, if you care about Zergle bimodules. Um, but let me just, just to wrap it up and to make it not too complicated, just explain this one. I stress again, it looks exactly the same, right? It looks exactly the same, which is pretty nice. Okay, so don't worry about those words, I will explain them in a second. But it's basically exactly the same. And this is my last slide, so let me just explain the words and I give you then some examples and then wrap it up. Okay, um, I also want to give you a hint why the bottom is so much more complicated than the top. So the top is the abelian version and the bottom is the additive version. And you just write it down, yeah, well, what categorifies an algebra? Well, some monoidal category with some extra structure, so monoidal abelian, for instance, or so the monoidal product will descend down to the to the Grotten degree as a product, and well, abelian is just the extra assumption here, or monoidal and additive, and of course you need to add it something extra which I completely ignore, like bilinearity or whatever. Anyway, so you can basically decide whether you want to have a monoidal abelian or monoidal additive category, and well, you need to add some. Ignore all those words. You need to add some finiteness conditions, blah, 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 blah. But the difference is, the real difference is, that abelian prefers simple modules. Right? The growth the group of an abelian category wants to have equivalence class of simples, of, of irreducibles, if you like the other word. I, I like the word simple. Uh, of simples. The um, growth the group of an additive category likes to have indecomposables. So the difference, and this is a crucial difference, I'll explain this carefully in a second. The, diff the crucial difference between those is that here I want the number of simples to be finite, and here I want the number of indecomposables to be finite. And this is really a crucial difference. Okay? So basically you should think in an abelian setup, the elements, like in the periodic table sense, the elements are the simples. In an additive setup, I don't even know what simples are, so added, uh, the, the elements are the indecomposable objects. And this is a huge difference. Usually for simples, you have something like a sure lemma. For indecomposables, there's no reason for a sure slamma, for sure lemma or anything like that. And you really don't have it. So it's much more complicated. Let me give you a really explicit example. I, I, my, my favorite example uh, in this setup. Okay, very easy. The easiest non-trivial example is the Klein group of order four. So it's, that's just Z2 mod A cross Z2. And I, I basically want to study its module category. And as long as characteristic is not two, I don't really care. It's, 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 uh, it's semi simple, right? In characteristic two, something funny happens. In characteristic two, um, uh, the group ring is actually isomorphic to, 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 to this algebra. So xy modulo x squared y squared. And if you only care about simples, so this is, this is easy, right? It's, it's, it's a four-dimensional algebra. Uh, <laughs> already here is a huge difference. If you only care about simples, then it has only one simple module because everything here has to act as zero and it's just a ground field. So if you consider K mod as an abelian category, you have one simple object, so it's just one element. That's a pretty small category. But if you are interested in indecomposables, here's an indecomposable that you can write down. It's very easy. I just, just uh, each, each vertex is a basis element of my indecomposable, and this is the action. So this uh, basis element is sent by x to this one and by y to this one. This one is sent by x to this one and this is by, sent by y to this one. And all of these are fixed points. So if I apply y twice, for instance, y, is, uh, y squared is zero. So this is the module. And there's absolutely no restriction on the number of, of vertices here. Could be anything. In particular, I've, I've, this is not a classification. The classification is much harder for this group. <laughs> um, but here's already a, 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 a list. Of obviously, they are not isomorphic because they have different dimensions. If I have different number of vertices, right? The, vert the number of vertices is just a dimension. So I already have, without much work, I already have an infinite list of indecomposables. So as, as an additive category, this has infinitely many indecomposable objects. So this is, this is huge, and this is basically super small. And this is a crucial difference between abelian and additive. Abelian is much easier because you care about symbols. 
Um, so this is a very nice example, the smallest one possible. So if you ever wonder, can you classify indecomposable modules for, for a random algebra? No, you can't. Classifying indecomposable modules is, is a hopeless problem. Classifying simple modules is a much easier problem. And oops, this is actually a funny, funny, funny um, theorem. Kind of if, very easy to remember if you want to uh, want to know the answer. So you can ask when is when actually has uh, this this G mod when has it a finite number of simple modules? Uh, it always has a finite number of simple modules. When has it a finite number of indecomposables? And it will ha happen exactly if uh, the P0 subgroup is cyclic. Okay, here the, the 2 0 subgroup is a group itself, it's not cyclic. A as soon as that happens, it's, you're dead. You have an infinite number of indecomposable objects. And of course, this is about to happen all the time. Daniel? Yeah. Since I saw that word again, what do you mean by multi tensor? Where do you saw that word? Here. Ah, um, uh, this should be tensor. So multi tensor would mean that the unit object is not necessarily indecomposable. But it's, it's so, so this is just the tensor category is, is just a, uh, an, an abelian monoidal category where the unit is indecomposable or the unit is simple. But, but the only point of the state, so everything here is trivial because uh, this one is a Hopf algebra, so you get almost everything for free. And the only thing you have to worry about is whether you have a finite number of simples, a finite number of indecomposables or not. And the answer is you have a finite number of indecomposables if and only if the P pseudo subgroup is cyclic. And this basically never happens. Anyway, um, thank you for the question. <sighs> okay. Um, yeah, so here's this explicit example that, that, semi, uh, that a billion is much, much, much harder than semi-simple. Uh, sorry, <laughs> a billion is much, much, much easier than, than additive. Um, because you really have to, have to force way stronger conditions on your categories to even have a chance to say something reasonable. You really want a finite number of indecomposables, otherwise you're basically dead. Okay, um, let me just wrap up. So, the abelian examples you can keep in mind that always that, that fits in this double centralizer theorem are so you take a finite dimension Hopf algebra, for example, a group ring of a finite group, um, and you, you take its module category. In the additive version, you would have to take its, its category of projectives because, well, if you take the, just a module category, as I just illustrated in that example, you almost always have an infinite number of indecomposables. If you, reject to, uh, if you restrict to projectives, each simple has a projective, indecomposable projective covers, we have a finite number of, of indecomposable projectives. But again, in this category, you don't have a sure slam, right? Because your, your, your elements are projective modules, and projective modules are fancy in the morphism rings. Um, yes, and in, in the semi-simple case, you can also think of, of something like graded vector spaces, super vector spaces, for instance, or just vector spaces. And um, why I like additive examples is, for instance, in the additive world, you could take tilting modules. In the, uh, in the, in the abelian world, you would have to take some, some finite set quotients, which are really horrible, of, of, of some, some G-mod. So, um, so you kind of want to have the additive, um, oops, because all of these are, are not, so you, you, all, of you, all of you have seen Zergle bimodules, Zergle bimodules are not added, a, a billion, they're additive. You want to have an additive version. Uh, category effect quantum groups are additive. Tilting modules are additive. Diagram categories are almost always additive. So you want kind of an, a, an additive version and you only really know the abelian version because it's so much easier. Ah, because you care about simples and you have sure slimline and everything. Let me just, uh, give you uh, an explicit example how this double centralizer theorem works and then, then I'm done. And I'm about to go over time, so I should be done. So, so the, the example is just a semi simple example. So um, I, I said the crucial example for the double centralizer theorem was K and, vec and, and matrices. You can play the same game here. So you can take 
vect, which is a perfectly fine monoidal category. It's the easiest one you can imagine, and it acts on anything. <laughs> um, and you can play exactly the same game. A, a little bit fine, uh, nicer example is for, for another one is, some, for instance, you can take graded vector spaces, like super vector spaces, and if you take the endomorphisms of, of VECT, which is a phase four module, you can just forget that you have a, 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 a grading, you can forget that you have an, even an odd element, then the endomorphisms, uh, so, so the centralizer is G mod, and the double centralizer is again VECT. So uh, VECT and G mod are Morita equivalent in this setup, if you want. Anyway. Um, for Zergle bimodules, that's that's my last slide. It's very complicated the story. Basically, uh, the double centralizer for Zergle bimodules are uh, if you act on the cell representation, then then Zergle bimodules are equivalent to the double centralizer of the cell representation. Something like that. Anyway, um, let me wrap up. So we have this double centralizer theorem, and you can't produce it to uh, and you have an additive version, which is much harder, and you have a abelian version, which is much easier. And um, you can't use it to produce new categories, but you can use it to say something like, uh, in very good cases, A and its centralizer and M are actually equivalent, uh, Morita equivalent, so they have the same, so the same module categories. And yeah, that's basically all I wanted to say. Um, this is a centralizer theorem. And its categorical version is the same. You just have to be careful about what kind of words you put where. Uh, but that's it. Thanks. Good. Thanks very much. <laughs> Are there any questions?